Hi, I'm Anthony Marinelli, and welcome to my first live stream on Anthony Marinelli Music. Uh, I just want to tell you guys how happy I am to be able to do this and get such a warm response from everyone. This is something that's very special to me. You know, I, I grew up as a teenager playing synthesizers, and it was at a time where, you know, there weren't very many people doing that. I didn't really have anybody to talk to. I could just sort of fool around with my friends, and it was definitely a fun thing to do at parties, but no one really knew, you know, or even Halloween, you know, when trick-or-treaters would coming coming around, and I, I could make sounds out of a speaker for people. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning is because it's that feeling that I'm kind of channeling into to today of the the not just the mystique and the lore of synthesizers because that didn't exist but it's like the childlike um, imaginative desire to, to play around with sound and and to make things that get people's attention you know that that are interesting and also to have an awareness of your world to hear a sound like to hear birds and then try to make that sound or a helicopter or a great bass sound that like like an electric bass player is playing like what is it doing and how could a keyboard player channel into that realm of tone but also be able to play it like in a keyboard kind of way and add vibrato to it and things that you can't do when when uh, you're a bass player not so easily so that's the spirit of this and I'm really like so grateful to everybody for following um, on social media and for subscribing now on YouTube we have a little bit of a thing going there we're making long videos so the the social media channel is giving you a taste and then if you're interested in it go to the YouTube channel subscribe that really helps me keep the momentum going so I know you're out there um, to do more and I do have access I can't read all of the um, comments but please continue to do that because I do get them and we're taking them seriously you know so we want to be able to supply the, the kind of interesting things that you guys want or need that are about synthesizers or you know it's it's about music really and also even some career oriented things like if this is the type of thing that you're interested in doing um, and tell me things that you're doing you know because we want to share we want to be like a, a little community to share ideas that are interesting you know because there's always a new little trick or tip that somebody could come up with and I'll say wow thank you for that and then I can credit you and share it to everybody you know so we're actually like synthesizers becoming like a legit instrument which it wasn't when I got started like there was a lot of hate we were I mean you know we were it was scary we were replacing instruments and the union was concerned about it composers didn't really know how to write for it um, even record companies you know they weren't as interested in it wasn't proven yet until the revolution that happened more more in the 80s so here we are I'm here to take your questions that's just a little preamble I quickly want to introduce you to my team they're gonna this is my live stream team and I couldn't do this without them they they get this working and now we're on OBS we're on a much better format things are looking better sounding better I have like if you can hear that right Can you hear that? Great. So now I have instruments. I can demonstrate things. If anybody wants to like have me do something on the spot, I'm more than happy to uh, make it happen or fall on my face. But that's like that's how it works with these kinds of instruments. So here's my team. I want to start with this is my oldest son Dante, and he's going to climb over here, and he is kind of really doing all the editing and running this stuff, and he's handling your questions, so you know who's going to be getting the questions and then he hey he, everyone <laughs> this is Dante and he feeds them to me and you know I, I made these guys oh, oh I made these guys do this watch for the cables now because I, I just want you to know that there's people behind this it's a real thing and, and they care a lot and then this is my engineer Ben Rackless who's been uh, doing the long videos the short videos and now he's handling the audio so all the audio stuffs happening here and I, I met Ben recently He's a recent graduate of the LMU, uh, what's the name of the program? Recording now? Arts Program. Recording Arts yeah. Program. 
and then we found each other and having a good time. So Ben is here, and you can ask questions for him too, you know, like recording synthesizer questions because he's getting kind of thrown in the fire here doing that, and <laughs> we'll banter that around too. So we're open to all of this. These, these, are, these are the people that are making it happen behind the scenes. Definitely. And watch your step. We've got a few cables in between me and them right now. So, um, you know, right now it's a, it's a Q and A show. I'm hoping to bring on guests that are going to be really interesting uh, of all sorts, you know, producers, other synthesizer programmers, um, great players, songwriters, and, um, you know, this, it'll just, we're going to listen to your comments too. And just, this is a fun time for, for me. Um, so let's start with any questions if, if we have questions. Um, I am Stephen Tucker said, what age did you start playing music? Hi, Stephen Tucker. Thank you for jumping on the, to this live stream. I started playing music, well, I started taking piano lessons when I was eight, and I was kind of forced to do it. It was classical piano. Fortunately, my teacher, uh, he made us do one lesson a month as music theory. So we had private lessons three times a month. And this was the best thing. Once a month, we had a class and we learned music theory. So I started at a young age really, really learning music. So I'm not like just off the street ear guy, which sometimes I marvel at those guys. But I think both, both are good, like developing your ear and um, learning it like the legit way. And fortunately, learning the theory at the same time, I would highly recommend that if you could do it. It was just a really unique thing. And finding a teacher that um, understands you because he knew that I didn't like it <laughs> and he had me washing his windows and then he's the one that turned me on to switched on Bach in 1969 I heard that record and then it was like what's that I want to make that sound so I was inspired by that so that's my really early background um, okay see uh, Bellary says no although there is one question when is the new video he asked, when is the new video? When is the new video? Yeah. What new video? Our new videos. When does the next video come out? Oh. Well, one just came out yesterday. That's pretty new. Mm -hmm. And then the next one is going to be, is it part two? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So it's going to be part two of the one that just came out. So it's about the opening, how to make the sound. And you, this is what it's for. It's so that you can make these sounds. Like... They're, they're, I've said this before, but it's important to reiterate it. They're iconic sounds because they're on an iconic record. They're good sounds and they apply to a lot of things. So if you learn how to make these kind of good sounds, you can tailor them to fit the songs that you're doing. And I wanted to point out in this video, the opening of Thriller has three different kind of synths on it that do the ba 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 part. There's the Prophet, the Jupiter 8, and then there's a synclavier part that gives it some bass support. So we did the first video on the Prophet, the second video is on the Jupiter 8, and the third video is going to be on the synclavier when we can get to a, a big synclavier. I'm, I'm going to go to my friend's house, I'm hoping, uh, and shoot it. So that's what the video is going to be, part two of the opening of Thriller. All right, BWM5150 says, Hi, Anthony, great videos. Uh, I love Thank it you. all. What's the most important skill that modern day engineer producers miss because they didn't learn with analog setups like yourself? Oh, I would say the basic left right audio chain and vertical control path. So I'll give you a demonstration. I mean, can you, can you see this okay? Okay. Yeah. So I like the 2600 because it's laid out very clearly. Everything that goes kind of this way along the top from left to right is the audio path. So the oscillators go to the filter, go to the amplifier, go to a mixer. Straightforward. And everything that goes up this way that you have a, a slider for has to do with controlling it. So very simply, if I had... Um. A sound. An oscillator goes to the filter. Get a really basic sound. 
and to the mixer. So that's your path that goes horizontally. And then the vertical path would be, let me take a sawtooth wave and then modulate that. Okay, the reason I'm showing you this, just so you kind of understand it like you would hear it, I think that's the thing that gets you miss out on. You don't get a chance to build from ground zero. Like engineers, the sound's already there. With a synthesizer, I think it would be great if like synthesizer people or programmers knew more about recording the sound. That would really help. But also engineers, that if they knew more about how to make the sound, really from the bottom up, where you have to start with the component level oscillator to the filter, and then knowing like that you can modulate that in different kinds of ways, then you're able to just sort of imagine a sound in your head and then imagine next to that how to make that sound, like sort of like draw boxes or something. That's what I used to do. And I could, you know, if I had a piece of paper here, you can grab me a piece of paper. Yeah, that's fine. Anything is good. So here's a box and then here's another box. Can you guys see those two boxes? So the signal path goes this way. You can hold it closer. OK, hold yeah. it closer. Signal path goes this way. So that's audio signal path. And then control signal path is you have a box here. And then you can control that, and you can control that. So this could be like an LFO or something down here. And I, it's like really that simple. It doesn't need to be overcomplicated. So understanding this, that you create sounds, the audio part this direction, and the control signal, th th I'm just thinking of it this way because it's easy to illustrate. The control paths go this way. Now you're able to just break down all the sounds you hear in your head and in your imagination into boxes. That's what I do. So I have like, what, which, which is the side of your brain? The creative side of your brain is the right side, right? So I have like the left side, I draw the boxes. And then the right side, I'm thinking like, well, what do I want to do with it? What can I create with it? And then I go back to the other side and draw the box. Then I go to the right side, and I start moving all the knobs with the right side of my brain. So I know it's like, you don't think about it that way, but I'm trying to explain it. I think it kind of works that way. So one side of your brain is analyzing pitch, timbre, duration, amplitude, oscillator, filter, envelope generator, VCA, that's pitch, timbre, duration, amplitude, and then the other side of your brain is creatively just moving the knobs, and that's like what people like to do. But if you understand the boxes part and the other side of your brain, you can put it together and then you can make any sound in your head. So there's the boxes, and then there's the right, the right brain. Is, that, is the right brain here? I think so, yeah. Sometimes I think it's, like, it's supposed to be the opposite. Yeah, the left brain controls your right side of your body. Yeah. Now it's, it's into physics, so I'm a little out of my realm. Okay. Dylan, Dylan H. asked, did you ever dive into making voices and presets on a DX7? It's my oh first synth, and I own one. I know it's a challenge, but it's fun to learn. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I had a Synclavier right at the same time as the DX7 came. I mean, the Synclavier came out a little bit before that, and, then, and it was the, kind of the first FM synthesizer that was available to the public. The, the DX7, you have you have six um, operators, and you can you have like certain algorithms of how you can design the operators. You can have three audio. It's the same thing with boxes, though. You have three audio ones, one, two, three boxes, and then three control ones that go underneath. They draw the boxes on the DX7 exactly like how I described it. Or you could have five boxes that are all audio in one controller, or you know any configuration. But the problem for me with the DX7 was diving into that menu and trying to remember you know, where you are, because it's all numbers. And I was coming from this. And then when the Synclavier came out, there's like a button and a knob for everything. So I kind of stuck with that. But you really can make some, some great, I mean, this is a good example of, why don't you send me some of your good vocal sounds, and I will attempt to break them down, or you break them down and we'll share them because I am not the quickest on a DX7. You know, I understand it, but it's hard for me to remember like where I am, so I kind of like dive in now. I wish there was a, I think there is a screen for it. That would be very helpful. So 
Um, I'm sorry I can't give you any really great DM7 tips for making vocal sounds, but that's my experience. Um, I am Stephen Tucker asked again, do you have a view on the recent sale of Moog? No. I don't even... I, I heard about it from Rob Rosen mm -hmm. over at Rosen Sound. And I don't know if it's going to be good. I mean, a lot of times it's not great. Rob just said that the company that bought it makes a lot of cheap audio electronics. Oh, well, so I mean, that's not going to be good. But, you know, there was Bob Moog running Moog, and then there was Moog, whatever the next thing, was it Moog Music or something, um, running Moog. And they kept, they had to kind of resuscitate it, I think. And then they sold a lot of stuff. There's some good new things. I'm not really sure, like, what the... I guess you'd be asking me to, to know what their, their sort of new mission statement is. My guess is to sell a ton of <laughs> stuff. So you'd have to sort through the quality stuff. Um, okay. One second. Let me find a good question. They're all good questions. King Ivy said, what were all the synths that were used on Thriller? It's one of my favorite albums ever. I'm assuming you okay. mean the song. Oh, on the song thriller, I definitely could tell you. Um, this mini Moog, was it used on thriller? I mean, it was at the session. I'm trying to think it was on any of the sounds. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. We made a video on it. So this is like the melody that plays during the, uh, the choruses. It's on this, mi this is the actual mini Moog. This ARP 2600 played the bass sound, and then... Can you guys see this Prophet over here? Yeah. Okay, so this Prophet 5, and it's on the video that came out yesterday, played the opening, one of the opening sounds. This is not the actual Jupiter 8, but it's a Jupiter 8, and it was responsible for the other sound. I don't have the synclavier here. And then the Lindrum, we have the actual Lindrum. I mean... You want me to show it? Well, you can, well he's going to bring it over. Oh. Over. I mean, it's going to look like a Lindrum, but it, it has chips. We did a lot of chip maneuvering. This Lindrum right here. Can you see it on there? Yeah. Yeah, and it's got screws in it, but if you open up the hood, and we'll do that on a video, and you can see all the chips. We had to, we had to kind of emulate the, uh, the LM1, which had different, a different sound because the, the demo was on LM1. So it was a combination of this sound with the LM1 and, um, you know, a bit of synclavier, the pipe organ. Do you remember anything else? The wind. I mean, that's ARP 2600, is the wind, the theremin, you know, here's the wind. It's as simple as this. Oh, yeah, the Casio. CT, is it the CTM 401? 401, yeah. Well, I don't know the initials. The CT. CT 401. So that's the frog sound. And this is the wind, and then, you know. Oh. There's one sound that we couldn't figure out what it was. I think it was a Rod Temperton one. That ba -na 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 -na. At the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember who did that. Rod, I mean, we did it actually, but I don't remember what it was on. I have to break. That sound at the very beginning, yeah, that, that's what Dante's talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's about it, you know? And the rest is there's live brass on there. That's the synths, though. Gustavo asks, what are your favorite pedals to use on synthesizers? Oh. I could tell you which aren't, all over the there aren't my favorite pedals that would be quicker. I have so many favorite pedals. I really like using pedals on synthesizers. Um... Well, I mean, I've got this set up here that the ARP, it's just ready to go for the ARP. I have the Big Muff, and it's an original one. This ADA flanger is great on synthesizers. The MXR analog delay, the MXR stereo chorus, and the Mutron phaser, and it's the phaser 2. I have, the, I have all of them, though. I mean, but that's like the basic setup that I like. Then I have every boss pedal. I mean, every one. And I have a Boss pedal board. I mean, I don't know. You want to put the camera down there? This is pedal tour time. So I'll just interchange them from my Boss pedal 
museum, you know, and put them in there. And then I have this stereo path that I like a lot and it has boss stuff and it has the memory man with the old chips in them. And then I run it through a reverb and then the reverb, I put a tremolo on the end of the reverb so the, the whole reverb gets tremoloed out or um, pan, you can pan the reverb left and right. I like that kind of thing. Then I have a modern little pedal board here with a bed panda context, a red panda raster. And I really like this filter. So like I could run a profit or something that doesn't have a multi-mode filter through it. And then I get a high pass and band pass filter that's like so great. So, and I can modulate it. You know, I, I, I really like this little modern thing. And then I've got these that I run the drum machine through. I'm gonna do a video on these later today. These auto pedals, I like to run drums through this. So I have a bit crusher, a warmer, which is a distortion and compressor, a di digital delay, and then a, a reverb. And these are modeled like after the lexicon um, reverb. So I have modern pedals. I kind of keep them together though. I showed you the vintage ones. And then I have an, a really modern pedal board for the, for, well, just one last one, just can just put it. That's like a modern pedal board for the uh, OBX. You can get the idea. And, and I've got other vintage racks, you know, like 80s racks with the Dimension D and stereo phase shifter from the 70s and that sort of thing. So I really like using pedals. Um, the engineers get my signal wet, but I also send it dry. I guess that's the important part because you can have fun and make the sound you want and then hear it in the track all the time, the right way, you know, with the, the kind of the original sound. But I also put it in there dry so you can mix in more transient, get it to sound more clear, because the pedals can kind of muffle the sound a little. And also, if you change your mind, you kind of know what you wanted and you can recreate it later, you could reamp it, and you know, you could use plugins too. Wow, I'm sorry, I'm giving a really long-winded answer, so. No, it's okay, you should. Is the ARP 2600 your favorite synth ever? Yes. <laughs> I learned on it. And I still think it's laid out the best. It's portable. It has a handle. It has a box. It has speakers. It has a preamp so you can distort things. You can patch anything anywhere. You can loop anything. You can't break it. You can just put chords in it and see what happens. Someone asked if they could hear the big muff and the ARP together right now. Yeah. That's fun. Okay, so pull this out. The big muff is great. I'll just take one sawtooth waveform, okay? So you don't hear like, okay? Something like a, like a bass. Great. And then I'm gonna take the filter. And the thing is with pedals, you have to get the level down to the pedal level. So, There's the big muff. I'm going to go into the big muff. So I use this Euro rack thing that has a, it's the AA1. It's a, made by Strymon. And it's going to drop the level by 18 dB before I hit the big muff. Okay, that's critical. And then it's going to bring it back up 18 dB on the flip side. And let me put it here so I can give you the straight signal too. There you go. Nasty. And I could gate it so you don't hear the noise. That's kind of fun to do. Put some resonance. So the big muff can really shred. No big muff. Big muff. Get a lot of clipping. And then I add straight signal. Here's the straight signal. So 
if I didn't have the big muff, I'd have this. Which is nice, but... So now I have this straight, and I can add big muff to it. You know, and it's quick, add delay. Oh, because I have, I'm gating it. That's what the delay. Pretty fun. And then you can flange it. That's with the flanger. So, and I'm gating it. So I have a release time on the gate. That's another thing, like I just use the ARP as the gate. You know, I run it through a VCA. This whole path goes through the pedals and then into this VCA, and then I can use this envelope generator to gate it. So that's not gated. Gated. Totally clean. There's a little demo. So Amsterdam Richard said, Hi Anthony, greetings from Amsterdam. What do you think of the current plugins compared to the real analog synths? Do you hear a big difference? No, they're amazing. There's not a big difference. I mean, and they're just going to keep getting better, you know, all of it. Virtual synths, um, effects, and all that sort of thing. I like knobs, so there's nothing for me to turn. I think that's a big difference. And when I mention like right brain and left brain and stuff, like I feel there's a tactical, a tactile thing that makes a difference in the creativity. And I, I think the analog ones, like so far, I mean, we do listening tests, we do blind tests, and we try to fool each other. And we do fool each other, but most of the time, the analog hardware is still a little bit like better, whatever that is, better sounding. But the digital, it, not always though, it depends on what it is. And the digital things have way more extras, you know, like they take the basic idea of some vintage thing and then they make it better. So. I think it's like the, all that matters is to write good songs and apply the concepts to whatever your instrument is. And if it's a virtual instrument, it's the same thing. You still have to dial the sound in, you know. And if you're calling up presets, then you can at least know like what you want to fix in the preset quicker. So who cares what it is? Um, these are just they're fun because of the knobs, you know. And they may sound a little better for some things, and they've turned into an investment so but other than that you know focus on the song and and knowing what you want to do with the sound that's my thought on it can you just talk about how you can articulate a little more expressively though with these well i okay so i said these have knobs mm -hmm. okay so yes they have knobs but then they also have like the wheel is right here and it it feels good. It was designed to work together. Like so, and again, you need to think about that. When you're putting together your, your system, like it, let's say you're using virtual things, build it so that it, it, it emulates what the engineers back then were doing. And then you can take it from that point and move it forward. Like you don't have to reinvent every, like excuse the pun, don't have to reinvent the wheel every time because the ergonomics of this thing are, are great. They're classic. Start there. Like if you have, if you are going to use a virtual thing and it doesn't have like a really good wheel or something, get one, put it here and then move it around and then experiment with other things, ribbon controllers and new instruments have all sorts of amazing controllers and keyboard pressure. And now everything could have like polyphonic aftertouch and that sort of thing. So I think what Dante's saying is, you know, there's a lot of controllers that are readily available to you here, you know? pitch wheel, mod wheel, I could instantly make it brighter. I, I just go to the place where it is, you know, octaves. How do you do that on a virtual synth all that quickly? You can, but you have to set it up to do that. So by knowing the components of the sounds, you can set it up so that the things that you want to move are readily available to you. With these instruments, they're just kind of built, they're engineered to be instruments. And that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle when we're only talking about sounds. 
I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, Frank James said that the R2600 is missing one thing, a joystick. <laughs> yeah. That's why I got this. <laughs> <laughs> joystick. I mean, well, that's yeah. What, that's what you use Eurorack for. It's that. Yeah. I use Eurorack for the things that are missing. Like, But these are extras. You know, a joystick is an XY controller, so you can put vibrato on one end and, and voltage on another, and you can control the instrument more intuitively. So yeah, it is missing that, you know. But the Moog Modular was missing that too. And then Mo Bob Moog sold one. And I, I, that's what I used to use on the ARP, was the old Moog. We, we had it boxed in this case. But um, it's a great controller, good point. But you know, you can get one in Eurorack for a hundred bucks, and then you, that's what, that's again, like what Dante's saying. Like I've got, um, what is that instrument? The, um, no more it says that. Oh, I know what it is. The PS3100 um, resonators, because I like those filters, so I can run the ARP through that. Like, I like the ARP for its, signal path and the sound of the oscillators and the filter and the VCA, the fast envelope generators, you know, all that sort of thing. But there's modern controllers that you can, for that vertical signal path, you can add to it and go nuts. Yeah, but start with a joystick. Universal Meditation asks two questions. One of them I know you're going to get really great, easily. Great name. Do you have a person that services all of your synths? Rob Rosen. Rosen Sound. Rosen Sound. And then his second question, is there any synth that you wish you had? Yeah, Modular Moog. I learned on that when I was in college at USC. They had a Moog Modular. Um, I learned on the ARP 2600, actually, but I, that was the one they had at school, and I had to do my projects on it, so I'm familiar with it. That's like something I would really like to have, but they can't even find one. They, they're really expensive, and then... You have to keep them working, so I mean, I, I would love to have one of those. Um, I'm a bass player who wants to play synth bass, but I don't know where to start. I have the bass station Novato. Oh. Do you know that thing? You're a bass player, like who wants to start playing synth bass, but doesn't know where to start. Right, but that mean, I'm assuming you play like electric mm -hmm. kind of bass or or stand up bass or something like that. Um, well. Knowing where to start, I mean, you already are a bass player, so that's the most important part of it. So you know how to make, you know how to play bass lines. You just need anything that makes sound that that's low. You know, that's it's it's not really. It doesn't matter that much. I would I would just get any kind of soft synth that. that I mean, there's just anything. Uh, a 2600, a Mini Moog, a Prophet, a JP8. Um, what's Novato? I'm not sure. I, he could also be the Novation base station. I, I, th I thought it could. Is that a pedal? Novation. Yeah. No, it's a synth. It's like it a is little. a synth. I mean, that seems like it would be great. I think it's more about just making a simple bass sound. You know, like get a pulse wave. Okay. I modulate it a little bit with the envelope generator so it sounds like a bass. I'm just going to emulate. So, and you just start changing it. Giving it a little ring. Getting a brighter. So, a couple of controllers. Put an oscillator in the filter, modulate the filter. If you can modulate the pulse width of the oscillator, do that. But play bass lines on it. If you're playing a low sound with, with basically a decay, you have a synth bass. You can add resonance to it and it makes it get that wow sound, make it brighter, make it softer. So there's like five things to do, and you're on your way. And then it goes back to the right brain. Be creative with that. And 
you know, learning how to make any sound in your head, you know, you don't need to do that if you just want to play synth bass. You just need a, a waveform, a pulse wave that you're modulating with, with, with an envelope generator, and then a filter, a good filter, and modulate the filter with that same envelope generator. So you can see that's what I mean. That's the envelope generator. See how it's short, then it's long, and then either bright or not so bright. And then you're controlling the pulse width. Otherwise, it just sounds like that. You hear the sound kind of talks a little bit. And that's it. You know, if you wanted to have vibrato, you can do that. I think you got it, because you know how to play bass. Spencer Scott said, what are some modern pieces of gear and sounds that you like that weren't available in the 80s? It looks like you got Eurorack going on. Yeah, I love all the new stuff. You mean, so it's not just like outboard gear, like studio stuff. Studio it's... stuff, pedals, maybe these MXR reamp box, something like that. Well, yeah. Stuff it... you wish you had back then. <laughs> yeah, the reverbs. Daws. <laughs> the what? A, a DAW. Well, yeah, a DAW. I mean, we use the Synclavier as a DAW, but like we, that was like our sequencer, you know, and we would be able to like layer. I mean, I wish that I had that for sure, having something like a DAW where you could record the sound and then change the sound at any time and go in and, I mean, we could kind of do that with the Synclavier. It was way ahead of its time, but you know, now you could do so much more with a DAW. And then, like, the quality of reverbs that are just, like, in the little pedal, it's ridiculous. And you can have tons of them. Like, you can have multiple, like, we, back then, we would have one reverb for everything. For the whole session. For the whole everything. For the song, for the mix, maybe two. I mean, for Thriller, I don't know, there were, like, three reverbs total on a mix. Like, now Did you, you have can... a chamber there, or no? They just, he, he just, Bruce liked to use the EMT. No lexicon? I don't remember, you know, I'd have to ask. Maybe. I can get the answer to that. I mean, we would ask Matt Forger because he was there for all the recording and all the mixing. But it, back then, you just didn't have that much. So, you know, sometimes we overdo it, though, because you put stuff, if you put stuff on everything, then it kind of neutralizes itself. But, you know, I would love to have been able to just choose, like, I want this compressor on this. You know, I want a Fairchild compressor. I want an 1176. And... You have all the plugins, you can do all that, and these modern pedals are ridiculous. Like for a few hundred dollars, what you can do, and they do it really well. They do tape, like Red Panda makes some crazy the tensor pedal, tape machine, you know, and and pitch modulations, and then we have like delays that do that you can tune the delays. Uh, it's it's like a synthesizer now. I guess that's what I like is that the new stuff is starting to think like that at the elemental level of sound. And it, it didn't do that before. It was just like a specialist that would come in and do one thing. And now you can dial in so much. Modern compressors, you can do so much now. And negative compression. I could go on and on. I mean, I'm, I love being alive now. <laughs> you feel alive. <laughs> Osiris X2S said, Hi, Anthony. Could you explain what was used for the synth bass for both Startin' Something and Billie Jean? By yeah. By way, awesome videos. Thank you. Thank you for watching the videos. Well, Billie Jean was a combination of Synclavier bass and a live bass player, Lewis Johnson. And it was an FM bass. So I'm going to do a video on it. Um, I can't remember if we have anything out. Um, Stories in the Room has something, right? Does that have something? Yeah, I'm pretty sure we talked yeah, about it. Yeah, there's a Stories that. in the Room. That's that's another series about Thriller that I did. It's um, on YouTube, and you can see the long video on how to make a Billie Jean bass. But I'll do another one. I don't think we did one for Starting Something. No. The bass. No. Greg played Starting Something. Something. And uh, that could have been Minimo. It could be, yeah. Now that I think about it. 
We did PYT based, Baby Be Mine, Thriller. Yeah, I'd have to really listen carefully on that. It's going to be either Mini Moog or, or 2600. Can you give us an example of how you use inverted envelope generators? Greeting from Venezuela. Hi. Thank you for, for viewing this. Uh, it's, There's it's, about 100 people in here. Wow. So, I'm, I'm just, yeah. I'm, thank you all of you and I feel like I'm one of you. You know, I'm, there's just so much for all of us to explore in terms of sound. It's like, it's a great thing to have, you know, it'll just take us all the way through life. Um, it's something to really look forward to, I think. It's, um, okay, so inverted envelope generators, um, right. So I'll start with an ADSR envelope generator and then, you know, I'll invert it. This is an inverter, so it's very simple. Output, input to the inverter, output from the inverter. Again, vertical signal path into the filter. I'll just use that same sawtooth waveform. There we go. Okay, so here's an example. So what happens if it's not inverted, you would have the A times, like just a slow A time. And it's modulating the filter. So I'll let you see it. ADSR to the filter. Get rid of that guy. Right? It just opens up and then decay time. So the filter is just closing. But if I invert it, then I need to open the filter, and then this will close it. So now the decay time sounds like the A time. And then when I release my hand off the keyboard, there's always going to be a sound there because I have the filter open. So basically, I start with the filter open, and then everything happens negatively, so it shuts the filter down. When you're not inverted, you typically start with the filter closed, and then the envelope generator opens the filter, right? So you have a closed envelope generator, like way down here, and then the envelope generator opens it. The other way, you have an open one, and then the envelope generator closes it. And then if I put it with the tack time, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sound like a hit. But the difference is it's, op it's coming from an open state. And so like if you were to do it with wind or something, you can get things like this. You can get a really sharp, which you couldn't do with a forward envelope generator. So that seems like something I should explore in more detail because I would like to be able to break it down, attack, decay, sustain, release, forward, and reverse, so you can really understand that. It's, it's, um, it's not complicated, but it's something you just have to understand what a negative, I mean, a, yeah, um, an inverted attack, what that does compared to a normal attack and then an inverted decay compared to a normal decay. So I'm going to make a note to do a more thorough, you know, description of that. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question and then I, I wanted to ask the audience kind of mm -hmm. like if they could send us some suggestions of what they videos they want to see. Oh, videos. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, um, and for live streams, you know, we're, we'll be presenting different live streams, though. And we'll, we'll see your comments, too, you know. We're going to try to do it every other week. Yes, yes. That's the plan. Um, so what's today's date is the 5th, 14th? Yes. Okay, so then the 28th should be our next live stream. So we'll, we'll give you a little bit of notice on that. And we're going to have new videos every Tuesday and Friday. 
yes. on YouTube. Tuesday, you'll see a short mm -hmm. and a long, and they should they should match. Mm -hmm. You know, and the shorts will go on TikTok and Instagram, and then the longs will go on YouTube, and then same thing with Thursday. So that's kind of where we are: a short and a long, and then. I'm going to be developing some other things behind the scenes, and then we'll be doing, you know, talking and Q and A's on the live stream. So, there you go. Yeah, if you guys have requests, just DM us on Instagram, and we can start, you know, making yeah. a list of stuff to get through that you guys really want to see. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, because we can respond to that, and you know, send. You can send stuff, patches. I mean, we haven't thought of doing that, but if there's anything cool. Yeah, it gives us ideas for stuff. Yeah like a patch sheet or something I could like show your sound you guys have any last questions I see this one did you program the synth for beat it uh, I played on beat I mean I programmed something on beat it it's it's a string sound that's kind of way in the background you know I, I I, ha I have to hear it again, but it's it like... It has a single beer through the rolling yeah. system 100 amps. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to say. It has a phase shifter. It's like two tracks of, of synclavier strings with the phase shifter on it. But that, that song sh went to a play bunch of different places. It was cut over at... It wasn't all cut at Westlake. It was cut over at um, Sunset Sound. You know, I think that's where Jeff did the drums. It was happening kind of at the same time. Because it, it did have a drum machine on the demo, and then Quincy wanted a live drum sound, and Michael, to give it more of a rock feel. So it was going to another studio, and then it was kind of moving behind the scenes. And then uh, I jumped, I remember jumping into Studio A. I was doing a lot of the stuff. I, most of my rig was in Studio B, because I was set up with so much stuff. So it would have taken up so much space in A, because that's where a lot of daily things were happening in and out really fast so we kind of had like a pretty good setup in B the whole time you know with, with with this rig but but I remember going into A to do the um the strings on that so I have two more there's kind of short ones um would you consider doing a studio tour video yeah we'll do a studio tour we want to set up right for it and um you know, figure out what format to do, you know, I guess I kind of want to hear them. So it isn't just, you know, look at this, you know, we'll, we'll maybe make a sound on all of them or I could tell you what I like about them. But that's another thing too, you know, like, what do you like about, what? why have so many synths, you know? Yeah, someone asked earlier why you have two arps. Right. But why do you have two arps? I have two arps because it's, it, it, it emulates a Moog modular. And the really big Moog modular has six oscillators and four envelope generators. And, you know, it, it has basically two of everything because it's two arps. But I treat it as one. So I'm able to, like, patch down. You know, I have long. That's why I have all these patch cords here. These are my long ones. So these are the short ones here. And the long ones go between the two arps. You know, I designed them to work this way. They have one keyboard, so it is like one synth. And you can just mix and match it. Like, I can take oscillators from there only and then put them into here. So I don't necessarily always have, like, two audio paths. It's not stereo ARP 2600. That's maybe what you would think. Like, I have two of them stacked. I, I rarely do that. Like, sometimes I might make the attack of something there and then the sustain here on this one. But most of the time, I'm just grabbing, like, oh, I need an extra noise generator because I want to modulate an oscillator with noise to make it sound like somebody's blowing into it. And then I also want to add some noise, you know, like in next to the, um, I had a reverse envelope on there, you know, like this. Maybe I want to put some audio noise, but I also want noise in there modulating the oscillator and then I want to add some audio noise so I can I can use different sources for different things so it's quite useful and I have more malts you know more that's kind of the thinking though is because you want to be able to grow and evolve someone said unison mode and it made me think about the chroma 
well unison mode but it gives me more of a chance of getting six you know six oscillators now it's getting to the level of like a profit or a jupiter eight i mean those have up to 16 on one note profit has 10 but now i can get six but the advantage on the on the six that i have is i have like individual control of each one because with those profit and the jupiter they're just what they are you know they're all going to be the same they're going to mirror each other but here i can have whatever different waveforms on each and different modulators it's kind of more towards having a an overheim four voice or eight voice you know but this is even different i thought this was a good one to end on king ivy says what is your process for choosing a certain synth for a sound yeah that's really important the characteristic of the synth is like the personality and this was a quincy thing he would pick musicians for their personality what they bring what they bring to the studio and their soul you know like their, their funkiness or their ability to kind of gel or groove with other people or play just the right fill you know and he would sort of he called it casting like like a film director and he would cast musicians and, and when he did color purple he cast composers because he had like over 20 composers at one time on color purple it's the first time that ever happened on a movie so you know i was around quincy a lot so i think kind of that way and he um you know the synths have personality to me there's a sound to them and then there's routing differences like some of them you don't you can't get like a mini moog doesn't have pulse width modulation so i can't make certain bass sounds on a mini moog that i can make on an arp 2600 but the mini moog has a very particular sound to it because of the filter and the vca even though this arp copied it and got sued it's still very unique and it also has pitch wheels that this doesn't have this is like i don't really like this pitch knob on the 2600 so for all the little personality differences now can i get by with one synth on, and do everything i could get by like if somebody would shoot me if i couldn't do it i'd get it done on one synth on a vst i'd get it done on a plug-in i'd get it done because i know how to make sound but if you really want to get into the nuances and you want to make like a film like a song could be like a film you think of it in that way and you bring in all the different like all your effects too have a personality and you mix and match them and you kind of just get it right where certain ones work with other ones and certain ones fight in a good way against them you know so they want to stand out that's how i think of it i think it's a really good place to, to leave it great well do you have anything you want to say in conclusion i just keep thanking you all i mean it's it's really fun to be a part of this with all of you you know i i'm one of you i i am equally excited to continue doing this and bring new things into the mix and 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 the new music's great that, that's coming out with combinations of this stuff so keep on you know inspiring me with all the new work and uh i hope to do the same and we'll see you in two weeks thank you guys